Well, I got my Bible open right at the end of John's Gospel, John chapter 21, verses 15 through to 19. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and will lead you where you do not want to go. See, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This might be the strangest conversation you've ever heard. Three times in rapid succession, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I mean, you could read it as if Jesus is feeling a bit insecure, but obviously that's not what's going on. So why does Jesus press Peter so hard on this question of his love for him? Well, do you remember in the upper room? You can read about it in John chapter 13. That night, Jesus warned the disciples that they would all fall away. They would all run into the night. And Peter stood up and he looked Jesus in the eye. And it was as if he said, Jesus, you are a liar. I will not do that. You don't know me, Jesus. Everyone else might run into the night, but not me. No, no, they might not stand by you but I will. They might think that they love you. They might think you are committed. They are committed to you, but I love you more. I am more committed to you than these other disciples. So yes, when they all run and hide in the darkness, I won't, Jesus. I won't betray you. I won't desert you because I love you more than all these other disciples disciples. And now, in John 21, here is Jesus resurrected in his glory. And it's as if he comes to Peter and says, Peter, last time we spoke, you told me that you loved me more than all these other disciples. Really? Really, Peter? Do you really love me more than these? And suddenly Peter's words seem so empty. All that bravado and rhetoric. I'll die for you. I'm more committed. And then three times, even on oath, Peter said, I don't even know him. And now, here is Jesus again, three times. Do you love me, Peter? Do you? Do you love me? And see Peter's response. There's no more of the comparing himself to the other disciples. No more playing all the other disciples down in order to make himself look bigger and better than he is. Whereas in the upper room, Peter had rejected Jesus' insights into his heart. Now, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Peter knows that Jesus' insights into his heart are all that he can rely on. You see, Peter can't say, of course I love you, Jesus. When all the others ran off into the darkness, I was there. I stood firm. He can't look to his experience and say, see, Jesus, you can depend on me. No, you see, all Peter has is his failure, and his sin, and 
his denial of Christ. And so you see, all he's got, all he can rely on now is Jesus looking into his heart. Lord, you know, you know that I love you. You see, all the arrogance, the pride, all the trying to show himself to be better than everyone else, it's, it's all gone. And all that's left is what Jesus knows. This is just between you and me now, Peter. And all Peter can say is, Jesus, as you stand here looking into my heart, you know, you know that in spite of it all, in spite of my failure, in spite of my denials, you know, you know that I do actually love you. And the next part of the conversation is pretty interesting as well, isn't it? I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And then John helps us. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Well, what's that all about? Well, again, go back to the upper room. Do you remember how Peter was going to prove his love for Jesus? Oh, when all the other disciples ran into the night, what did Peter say he would do? I will lay down my life for you. See, that's how Peter was going to show that he was the greatest disciple. Except, of course, he didn't. And it's probably just as well he didn't die for Jesus that night in Gethsemane. If he had, his death would have meant nothing. It would have achieved nothing. It would have been utterly meaningless because Peter's death would have been all about his pride. It would have been all about him proving himself to be a better disciple than everybody else. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that we can give our body to the flame. If we don't have love, it means nothing. And so here again, we have Jesus confronting Peter. And it's as if he just picks up the conversation where they let it, left it off. Hey, Peter, you said you would die for me. Well, now we've got your arrogance and your pride and your self-aggrandizement and your self-exaltation and your self-confidence and your self-determination and, and your self-importance. Now we've got all that out of the road. Now that we just have your love for me, now let me tell you that you will die for me. And when you do, it won't be about you, Peter. It won't be about glorifying you. It won't be about you proving how much better you are than everybody else in the church. No. When you do lay down your life for me, it will be because of your love for me. It will be about me. And it will be about glorifying me. Because that death is now the expression of your love for me. You see, Jesus brings Peter right back to the upper room. And he picks up the conversation where he left it off. But because Jesus has now been through the cross, and now that he's been resurrected, that conversation has such a very different ending. See, Jesus can stand before Peter and say, Peter, I have dealt with your sin. I have dealt with your failure. I have dealt with your denial. And now, as your resurrected Lord, I am beckoning you into a different kind of life. Peter, come and be a different kind of person. Come and taste new creation, resurrection, humanity. In spite of your failure, in spite of your sin, come with me into the resurrection life. See, we struggle with that kind of grace, don't we? 
I mean, we look at this and we see that only a couple of days ago, Peter was running into the night, denying that he even knew Christ. And yet here he is, being restored, given responsibility and authority over even the most, most mature of believers. And we see that and we think, well, oh, 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 okay, okay, but you know, at least let's put him on probation. I mean, let, let's have a time of testing. Let's make sure that his repentance is sincere and, and genuine before we risk giving him the kind of authority and responsibility that Jesus is laying on his shoulder. And you see, the reason that we are so unsure about what Jesus is doing here is that we do not understand how transforming a thing, the raw grace of the Lord Jesus Christ actually is. We're not sure that grace actually changes anything. And we're afraid that somebody like Peter might just take advantage of that grace and that his sin will go unchallenged. And that's because we think of grace as just going and saying sorry to Jesus and then, then we can carry on as if nothing has happened. But that isn't how grace works. Listen to the Apostle Paul teach us about grace in his letter to Titus. Chapter 2, he writes, The grace of God that brings salvation, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, in the last 72 hours, Peter has come face to face with his depravity, his spiritual bankruptcy. He's been through the godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Listen, when you are confronted by the reality of your sin, when your heart is broken in repentance, and when Christ comes to you at that moment and says, I will not treat you as your sins deserve, that encounter changes everything. Again, it might seem so counterintuitive, but when Christ meets you and offers you His grace, it transforms you. It changed Peter. It brought profound, lasting, and absolute transformation. Grace completely changes us. And that's why Jesus can take a man who 72 hours ago failed so radically and show him such a deep expression of grace and be so confident that it has so changed Peter that only now is he qualified for the responsibilities that Jesus has called him to in the life and the ministry of the church. You see, Peter may well have been thinking, I wonder if Jesus will ever have me back. When well, Jesus does take Peter back, he takes him right back to the beginning. When Jesus first called Peter, Peter was fishing and Jesus was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And here, Right at the end of John's gospel, we find Peter again fishing. And Jesus again standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And in spite of all Peter's denial of Jesus and disowning of Jesus, in spite of all the sin and failure, here they are. Back at the beginning. And he hears the call of Jesus to come and follow him again. Come with me, says Jesus, into, into a new creation of humanity. Come with me into the resurrection life. Come with me and be a different person. Yes, yes, you sinned. Yes, you failed. Yes, you denied me. But your sin will not be the final word. The final word will always be the grace of the resurrected Christ. Follow me. That is 
how we are changed.